week, we are going to pack 45 minutes of collaboration into this presentation. That's collaboration with me, the panel, and you guys as well. So as we go throughout, raise your hand, interrupt, ask questions, don't wait till the end. All right. A little bit about me, um, as Ann said, I spent the last 25, 30 years right in this city running and leading a marketing and public relations agency, working with the nations and the world's leading consumer brands, from Amazon to Nike to Coca-Cola to Nestle, uh, creating marketing campaigns for them. For the last couple of years, though, I've had the privilege of being at Rutgers University teaching marketing to undergraduates and graduate students. So I get to spend every single day with Gen Zers. It's the greatest thing in the world. I've got my own think tank, my own incubator. I teach them about marketing, and they teach me about trends. One of the outputs of that was I spent a year crisscrossing America interviewing Gen Zers from age 13 to age 23. How do they consume content? What are they doing on social media? What are they looking for in future employers? What are they looking for in future workspaces to Mark's presentation? And we're going to talk about all that today. The best thing about this is while I've got the data and the research, we've got the real Gen Zers up here. So they're going to be the ones who are going to give you the, the good stuff, right? I'm going to give you data, research. I do quarterly surveys with Gen Zers, but they'll bring it to life. So uh, on my far right, Sally Melly, who's in with Compass, but more importantly, works in real estate marketing. Uh, just about a week ago, got engaged too, so congratulations, Sally. All right. In the middle, Adam Gray, who is a Division I NCAA golfer at Rutgers University, over the past few months has decided that he's going to focus more on his career, and is now here working in investor relations in New York City, and is wrapping up his last few classes as a graduate student at Rutgers University. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And certainly, last but not least, Sydney Groves, who uh, also went to Rutgers University, works here in the city with the Public Relations and Social Media Marketing Agency. I think it was sophomore, junior year, Sydney produced, hosted, produced, and distributed her, her own podcast on Gen Zers, uh, which is pretty darn popular. I loved it. So, Sydney, thank you for doing it. Sydney and I have done this quite a few times before, and uh, she won't hold back. She will, she will give you the truth, um, and you'll have a lot of fun with this. So, let's dive right in, because we do have a lot of slides. This is the, really the only slide we need to worry about today. <laughs> Gen Z is the first generation that learned to swipe before they wipe. There are no other slides after this. They've had technology in their hands since the age of one. Sydney, do you want to just comment on this slide? Um, so I actually, while I was at, um, in school, I taught dance classes of young girls and boys age 4 to 18. And they are wild. I do not recommend it. I do not like them. But <laughs> today, all have phones. There are four-year-olds that have phones. They're like, Miss Anita, can I have my phone? I'm like, uh, no, go back to dance. But they they have no control over their technology. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm not a parent, but I wouldn't give it to them. <laughs> but you're saying, to your point, four-year-olds now with these phones, yeah. using these phones, right? I mean, I didn't have a phone until, I want to say I was in high school. Like, I didn't have a phone. Well, you're an older generation. Right? Yeah, I'm like one of the older ones. <laughs> Adam, Sally, any just comments? Uh, uh, is this working? <laughs> He's not the tired guy. Yeah. And yeah, to, to touch your point, um, elementary school, I remember having my flip phone. It's like every single memory throughout my childhood, there was always some iteration of technology, whether it was, it was with phones, video games, computers, or watching TV with my dad. I always was integrated with technology, and now you see it's even more prevalent. Um, you see kids at, uh, at dinner to have their, kid, to have their kids uh, quiet down, you, you see a lot of uh, iPads and you see stuff like that at dinner, even at the dinner table, so. Yes, same exact thing. I mean, I'm really on the cusp of this generation. I'm actually the last year of the millennial generation, but I'm kind of on that in-between phase where in my early ages, I didn't have as much technology, although growing up with my mother, there were video conferencing already in our household, just being in our office. So I had a really at an early age understanding of what was to come. And as I started getting into that middle school age, things like Facebook came out and it was kind of that gray area of should we be allowing this for kids so young and how are we adopting this as we're getting older and I started kind of just going right through into this technology from a social aspect, uh, from a school aspect. I remember we had a lot of computer classes, that was one of our main courses we had to take was learning all of this technology and in toys, a lot of our toys started having technology as I was getting older. So I love the commentary, but some of you are out there saying why should we care? 
who cares about these Gen Z as well? You need to care, because in 2019, Gen Z became the largest consumer segment in the world. They outnumbered you. There's more Gen Zers in the world, in this country, than any other segment. Millennials, boomers, Gen X, it doesn't matter. They are taking over the world in a positive way. They are transforming the world. There are more Gen Zers who are going to be entering the workforce over the next 15 years than any other consumer segment. If you're a marketer, you need to truly understand Gen Zers. You're going to be out of business in 10 to 15 years because they have incredible buying power. Now, a lot of them are still in high school and college, but they're influencing mom and dad on consumer purchases. Sally mentioned she's kind of a hybrid, and I would agree. Um, but let's first, to your point, when was Gen Z born? What's the age range? All that. So, anyone who's, who know first year Gen Zers were born, you didn't give your birth date. So, first year they were born, 95. So, unofficially, I like to say 95 all the time. It's just a nice number, right? 1995 to 2010, right? Pew Research Center, who's Got a pretty good reputation out there. They officially a few months ago declared 97, but I still love to use 95 to 2010. But either way, if we go with the 95 to 2010, right, we're talking about your oldest Gen Zers now are 24, 25, right, and your youngest are in elementary school, and a bulk of them are in college and high school. But just to set it up, so when you leave here, at least you know Gen Zers are right in that that range from 95 to 2010 or so. And then we get into Gen Alpha, but we'll do that next year. We'll do Gen Alpha next year. Right? <laughs> So as I research Gen Zers, as I collaborate with folks like these up here, go across the country and meet with them, I kind of narrowed it all down to what I call the six degrees of Gen Z. They are the most diverse generation ever. Diversity and inclusion are really, really important, especially when it comes to the workplace. We talked about it already. Tech smart digital natives. Uh, Adam made a point. It's interesting when you get the perspective of someone like him who may be 22 or 23, and then you interview a ninth grader I just spent last week with. 40 ninth graders were all in the STEM program. I walked in, they were all building robots. I knew right away I was in trouble. <laughs> but those ninth graders are even that much more advanced when it comes to technology than you know, 21, 22, 23 year olds. They have an incredible entrepreneurial spirit. Give them a chance to build something, to create something, to make something, create a new revenue stream. They will not let you down. They love experiences, especially Instagramable experiences. They are very community-minded, socially conscious. They really do prioritize purpose. They want their employers, the brands they support, the companies that they buy their products to have a purpose over profits. Don't just, I don't want to just be transactional. What is your purpose than just selling me a widget? And so I talk about these five priorities. And again, this all applies to the workforce, has more and more Gen Zers uh, join the workforce. Diversity and inclusion, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Diversity and inclusion. Gen Z does not see color. They just see people. They want to collaborate with others. Immersive and shareable experiences. I put a couple of examples up here. Cassie, who's a former student of mine, is at Amazon. I love her LinkedIn page just because she's constantly posting images of her and other Amazon employees participating in these immersive experiences. And then she shares them with the world and says, I work for the greatest company in the world. Right? And we see the same example with folks uh, at Target, which later I'll talk about is probably up on the leading edge of engaging Gen Zers and understanding Gen Zers. As it ties to technology, and it's what led to it, speed, immediacy, efficiency. These guys don't like to waste time. They like to get the job and figure out how do we do it most efficiently but also effectively. Personalization, that's not just products. That's just not buying a pair of sneakers and being able to personalize it or getting a can of Coke with your name on it. It's actually going into a job where you can actually personalize and customize that job and responsibilities. As opposed to when I came out of college, just handing me something and saying, this is what you're going to do. They want to be collaborative in that. And the last but not least, we talked about purpose over problem again. The idea, we all, whether it's an employer, a brand, a marketer, have to serve a higher purpose than just what it is we do. Okay. So I did go through by the numbers, and as I said, throughout we'll interact with our group here. So, another question here. What social media channel platform does Gen Z prefer all, over all others here in 2020? Instagram. 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 Look. And you got a prize. <laughs> You're going to get the book later. <laughs> Snapchat is very close. We're gonna, we'll, we'll bring it to life here because we may have different preferences at the stage, on stage here. So, the numbers vary every quarter when I do these. Instagram, because of Instagram stories, is incredibly popular. Snapchat's not that far behind. I don't know if I have a slide in here, but what I do say is that Gen Z doesn't do the F word. 
They can't stay on Facebook. They're not on Facebook. The only reason they're on Facebook is to, you know, maybe send an update once in a while to mom and dad. Say, hey, I'm doing well in the big city, mom. Here's a photo of me at work. We want to talk, uh, I'll start with Sally, just social media preferences. So, Instagram is absolutely correct. I actually had to limit my screen time to under three hours a day because of how much I I was spending on these platforms. And a part of my job at Compass, we're a technology startup. So as an advisor, my customers, my clients are brokers and agents. So I have to put strategy together for them on these platforms daily, meaning I actually use these not just for myself and my personal life, and to collaborate with my clients and have a better understanding of how to advise them to market to their best consumers. Um, right now, really, Mark kind of nails it on the head for Facebook. I'm only on it for two reasons. The older relatives that my mom says I have to keep in touch with somehow. <laughs> and the other reason is to be able to understand the technology as Facebook's growing and doing more advertising opportunities so I can then best advise my customers. Uh, but really right now, from you know, the social standpoint for my generation, we communicate through these platforms. You know, occasionally, yes, we'll text and call each other, but a lot of the times how we get updates on each other is follow each, following each other on Instagram and saying, oh, I just saw you checked out this restaurant last week and saw it on Instagram. And that's really how we collaborate now. Adam, you want to weigh in? I know you're big on TikTok, so what? <laughs> TikTok, TikTok, I do enjoy it. Um, <laughs> for my own personal sake, um, it kind of goes in, to an extent of like how, uh, how close I am to somebody. With Snapchat, it seems like that's my most, per it's for my closest group of my most personal friends, excluding my family, because it's, I text them and FaceTime them, FaceTime them and call them. But then when it gets to Instagram, that's more, that's using the filter, using filters of personalization and getting all the content that I want. And that's why it, going on to YouTube, then it's like, I don't even watch TV anymore. It's because I have everything I want is right there. And, and then Facebook, it's, it's nice just to see polarization of the two political parties and also just for, uh, for your occasional groups. Save your YouTube, where do you guys at? Sydney, I know you almost invented TikTok, because three or four years ago she brought TikTok up to me and said, yeah, right, it's coming. You see a fine theme, uh, uh, but I would actually have to disagree with Adam about Snapchat being more for personal, um, like closer friends, because I think that Snapchat, even though it's an ephemeral community, it mimics face-to-face -face communication. I think like texting uh, creates like, a false sense of intimacy. So say if there was like a guy and like I was interested, but like I didn't want to like date him. Like I didn't want him to fall in love with me or something like that because it happens so often. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would just I told you she doesn't hold back. I would just Snapchat him so he doesn't you know fall in love with me because like talking to me means money. But um, Instagram, I definitely am like my most authentic self. Like some people are posting things that really aren't like their lives and it can cause like mental health issues because people can see that. But I always post like real things that I'm doing. Um, that's really my life. I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary that I wouldn't usually do. Um, but it's definitely a lot like cleaner compared to what my Snapchat is. I'm not doing anything bad, but like my parents and like follow me you know on instagram so Cindy, if i can kind of chime off on what both of you were saying you know i think with snapchat a lot of it kind of going i think into more you're saying before it's if you know if i'm really ugly i just get out of the shower and i want to make a funny face and send something to my friends but i don't want the world to see it i would go on snapchat to privately message it versus instagram is so much more curated right i have my customers follow me on instagram i'm public anyone can go look me up right now it's what i really would allow the world to see and be okay with the world to see um, and I think it's a little bit more of a networking tool as well from a brand perspective. I find out about a lot of new brands when I'm shopping on Instagram now. So if I actually will see by from the influencer standpoint of things now, following influencers who are being paid by a lot of technology firms, fashion firms to post and you know, comment on these products, it's definitely a more organic way, even though it may be filtered, for me to then see, oh, if it's something Google just launched at home, I'll see an influencer and I'll get targeted ads from it, and that's where I actually may buy from. I've had a lot of different products that I've discovered and ended up purchasing because of Instagram. Just on that note, we had a 90 minute class night last night. We dedicated the whole class to just interactive advertising on Instagram, on Snapchat, that's you mean, interactive advertising and purchasing. So let's keep going with some other things. The other thing that, uh, now they, again, these guys may argue a little bit about this because it, it varies, but well, they don't do the F word, they also don't do the E word, email, right? There's a Fast Company headline from late 2019, Gen Z employees don't do email. Well, yeah, of course they email, but they prefer other methods of technology and communication perhaps to get things done faster. 
I can think of a large Fortune 500 company I work with on a regular basis where internally, and they've got 50,000 employees, they really prefer now texting and instant messaging to just get answers more quickly. Anyone just want to weigh in? So for Compass, we are, as I mentioned before, we're a technology firm as well as startup, as well as being a brokerage. So with a lot of what I do in a day-to-day, -day, and I'm constantly collaborating between my customers to the people on my team, email is really good for something more static, right? A very important process update that you're going to be sending out to the team. I'm going to favorite that. I, I house my email on folders, and I'm very organized with it. Versus if you're telling me, hey, X, Y, and Z just came up to us at our open office hours and wants to meet with you, don't send me an email, right? You're going to flood my inbox. I get workplace chatted or Google chatted, Gchat. So that's more of the instantaneous way we do things. And what we've done now is aside from being on my laptop, which I take everywhere, it's in that corner over there, I also have all of those same exact apps and interfaces on my cell phone. So if I run out to get my lunch and there's some important update I need, you know, if you email me, it's gonna get lost in my inbox unless it's an important process. If you quickly workplace chat me, I'm notified almost faster than a text message and I can answer you back wherever I am. Any other thoughts? Yeah, so piggybacking off that, I just think that there's kind of layers to it. Um, with email, email's obviously traditionally always used and it's been great for me and my experience, but to even streamline that a little bit more, I've had experience, I've used uh, Mixmax. A lot of people have probably used Mixmax, yes, no? And, uh, it's like, well, it's just like, it's like, let's say you want to have a template, you have a template for your email and Mixmax saves all your templates, it, should, it keeps track of all your emails, it says which, re which recipients view the emails, what time they view the emails, it just like gives you a bit more of an interactive experience, both like in the user end and the back end of uh, emailing. So that just made emailing a bit more easier for me. However, then when in the workplace, I like using GroupMe, Slack is great. It's just dep it depends on the mode of communication. If you're talking to your coworkers, send them a text, go on GroupMe, go on Slack. But yeah, like she said, when it gets to more formal things, I, I like email will always trump. Um, in my office, we use like Microsoft uh, Suite and then we have Slack. Um, over the summer, when I have an internship, we use uh, Google Suite, I guess. And I'm the type of person, like, I'll go up to your desk and talk to you, like, I don't care. Um, and as long as, like, we're both not busy, like, I obviously would never interject on your time. Mm -hmm. But um, I had walked into the office one day, and I said hi to my manager, looked him in the eye, hi, Martin, how are you? I took a step up the stairs, and I got a message from him. I was like, you couldn't just tell me. Like, yeah, I was right there. And he wasn't a Gen Z, or he was he, about Yeah, so I was just like, okay. But they just loved to chat, like, why not just communicate? Your life, but um, you know, email. I definitely use email a lot in the workspace still. Uh, but that's like for tasks. If I get a task, I'll ask and I'll highlight it, or you know, ask some questions just so I can, you know, I have that visual representation. Because with a Slack message, those are constantly going. It's up in the timeline. I, I don't want to have to scroll. Sydney so brings up a great point. Yes, of course. Do you, do you guys actually get into a sense where you have like app fatigue? Do you? Is that no, that personally, no. For me, for the like, most part, no. But I so found I So he was asking if we ever end up with app fatigue. Um, so when we're at that point where we just can't look at it anymore. Um, there are days I have that. I actually have days I've started wearing blue light glasses because I spend so much time staring at the screen. I've noticed my eyesight going um, at a very young age, which is terrible. But um, from an app perspective, there are days. So for instance, like I said, the social networking became a lot because I use it for work and I also use it personally. So that's where I started noticing, in a sense, that fatigue where I actually, Apple now lets you set a screen time limit on any app you wish. So that was kind of my way to diffuse that a little bit. But at work, you, you really don't have a choice now. Um, especially in a tech startup world, we, we are always on systems, and that's just how we're going to be able to function. There's another question here. Yeah, so shallow, you mentioned shallow work versus deep work earlier. With so many different platforms, and you're getting bombarded by so many different notifications, do you guys exercise any type of do not disturb time or deep work time? How do you navigate that? Can I add to this one? My phone is permanently on do not disturb. It's just. How do you balance? How do you balance? Uh, How do you balance deep work versus shallow work? And you were saying no, just with so many platforms. Oh, with so many. Being bombarded by all these notifications. How do you navigate that mm -hmm. so that you're getting work done? Personal self accountability. You are your own brand, and you got to manage yourself. And that's like that's your extension of yourself. So it's like that's if someone's like 
putting a sticky note on your desk. You have to be on top of that. And I personally have my phone on do not disturb at all times because I despise notifications and I find it in my own, it's, it's my responsibility to attend to those notifications regardless if I get them or not. So I just check my phone, go through it. It's like, it's just like doing laundry. <laughs> I love notifications. I'm always on. I will answer an email at 10 p.m. when I'm out on a Friday night. I don't care. I totally will do it, and I will bill you for my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, for me, in, in that regard, I find that a lot of these systems also allow do not disturb settings or your out-of-office notifications. So, for instance, we use Workplace Chat a lot. They actually now have a setting that I can put on. You know, if I'm in a certain meeting or if I'm out, so that it, my coworkers are notified when they do chat me that it, it shows them on that do not disturb mode. Um, I also live off of my calendar digitally now. I used to be in college someone who wrote everything out and everything is digitally now that I can open on my computer, my phone. I live off of just calendars and it's really time management in this generation, especially with these systems. So I actually say to my customers, we work with Zendesk heavily, which is a ticketing system that you can email, a more generic email, but it then gets filtered to me. And I actually say to my customers, I've set an out of office that pretty much says, if you email my personal email, I may not get back to you immediately, but if you email us at marketingatcompass.com for Zendesk, I get a notification with two hours I must reply to you. So it's kind of just setting those standards with your customers and also internally with your staff to know what the best way to communicate is and how to set your out of office if necessary. We've got someone in the back. One more? Oh, we'll go to the back. Million 
cards down in restaurants can annoy with you. And now, you know, with Venmo, everyone has Venmo. They have QR codes you scan each other on with. And one person just puts a card down and says, all right, I'll Venmo you afterwards. You get a Venmo request and you're good to go. Um, and so Venmo, for me, has become so efficient when it comes to spending time with between colleagues or also with friends as well. So um, I actually have my personal bank account directly linked with Venmo, and it's, if you pick one to three business days, it's free. So I work with TD Bank, that's my bank that I have, and I do not get charged a fee at all. Hi. So um, from a perspective of efficiency in my life, I agree with her in Venmo, but to just not say a piggyback on Venmo, <laughs> uh, Amazon is awesome, especially for like my life as a college student. I don't always have time to even just do the basic things and go to uh, the grocery store just to get um, toilet paper, like stuff like that. <laughs> so it's like with Amazon Amazon Prime, I just say, I just add, add, add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. Next thing you know, the next day I have 20 bags of all my favorite chips. And to piggyback off of your Amazon quickly, they have a lot of AI technology now um, yeah. embedded. And my boyfriend and I, we joke, my, my dad and my boyfriend are the Amazon Prime kings. Every single day we're getting a box. But Alexa, we have in our apartment, is so smart now that she says, okay, you know, we have a dog. You know, do you, it's about time you're going to need those potty pads again. And she's right about when we're running out of them, put a reorder in. Um, we get our groceries delivered. We live in New York. No one wants to carry groceries here. Our groceries get delivered. We were in France. We pre-ordered them for when we got home. Sure. Don't let me on Amazon because I will buy everything. I will buy a comforter. I don't need it. I have three. I bought one. I don't know. It was like, it's an addiction. I need to stop. Like, this is actually my intervention. <laughs> All right, so Gen Z and work. So, yes. Side, side, sideway for a second before we get into just the work. What video platform? I mean, there's, you know, obviously Netflix, that's ingest, but I mean, in terms of, you know, communication. What video platform do you guys all like? To so from a video platform perspective, are you wondering from a, what we like to watch or how we connect? Communicate to, yeah. So your for friends, me, your work, yeah. FaceTime is huge. Um, the other thing aside from FaceTime in the workplace, we, we have Blue Jeans set up in our workplace, so we always have Blue Jeans linked to our calendars. Um, but aside from that, I also think Instagram as well now. They have Instagram TV, you can go live on Instagram, you have stories, um, you can directly send a video on Instagram, so that would probably be the other platform I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, FaceTime is always really nice and immediate. Um, but if that's not uh, accessible, then I, I mean, Snapchat, it just Snapchat update videos is, all, is always uh, something that's very common uh, for me. But uh, Instagram TV is awesome. And then just YouTube and, and Twitch is great too. Twitch is really awesome for really custom kind of. And we already hit on those. Oh, you are? Not usually just send videos on Instagram. So, Gen Z and work. So, yes. Instagram. It's, I know how I react to this, the scandals of the influencers where they're photoshopping not only themselves but where they're actually are. I know, I see, I didn't follow. How are you reacting to that? I don't follow influencers. I refuse to because I don't deserve my follow. <laughs> so I love influencers. Um, I actually find influencer marketing in this whole world that's kind of gotten brought up with influencer community very fascinating. Um, because you're taking you know, organic people that may have never had you know, a platform before who develop themselves a platform, most of the time organically, sometimes yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, and although they edit things, I find the influencers I'm most intrigued by are the ones who go live. They talk to you on their stories. They show their personality. They show their everyday life. And they will actually honestly review products. Um, the ones that are fake, you usually can tend to see through. And after a while, most people do unfollow. The second part of it is the tools you're using tend to be mostly US based centric tools. So, are you interacting around the world with what tools you make? So, I did a study abroad program. He was asking about international tools. Um, I did a study abroad program in China, so WeChat was something I did get on after that program to keep in touch with friends. Um, the other thing is WhatsApp. Um, WhatsApp Messenger, I, one of my best friends lives in Singapore, and that's how we communicated. I just video chat her through WhatsApp, um, and then I'm still able to communicate with her. So, those are probably the two platforms I found myself using from the international perspective. Okay, first. I'm Gary Berger with LeBron. So I'm finding what you guys are saying is very, very interesting. That's very simple statistics. Facebook's annual revenue in 2019 was something over $70 million. Right? Instagram, which is on Fox Network Road as well, revenue was approximately $20 million. So what I heard you all say, Facebook, your dad, mom, and grandma, and Instagram is my thing. Do you perceive, this is just an opinion, the future to reverse that ratio, basically, 
textbooks. So from my experience, at least from a workplace environment, I think one of those reasons for Facebook is that all of your advertising, when you're booking advertisements, you do it through Ads Manager on Facebook. So we think of Facebook as that umbrella. So although when you're saying I'm running a Facebook ad, it doesn't always just go on Facebook. It goes to Instagram, WhatsApp, Audience Network, Messenger. It goes on to all these different things. Um, so that may be one of the reasons the comments are showing. If you're billing, you're billed by Facebook directly, so that may be one of the reasons they use that as that umbrella. Um, quite frankly, though, I, I, we still are on Facebook, don't get me wrong. So a lot of things, Instagram is a switch. You can hit that switch and it will also share what you post on Instagram to Facebook as well. Um, I just think our generation, you know, Facebook, almost like we were saying before, it has become too political, it's become a lot of fake things on Facebook, but we can see right through that in our generation, where we will still be on it for our older relatives or maybe to see random updates, but past that, I think Instagram is going to keep lifting up. But my, my, I'm curious to see almost their books on Facebook, yeah. just because they are that umbrella, and it may just be that it's built under Facebook, although things are still going on Instagram. In the back. Well, um, I I'm a very strong believer that VR, AR, MR kind of will be the future. Not so much of how we use it in the workplace, it'll be more how it's integrated with our lives with, let's say, uh, biotech and how we can use it for health, health concerns and, more, and uh, when you're dealing with uh, di diagnostics and diagnosing people's health issues, that and also just experiencing brands through VR and AR. And I've worked, I've seen a lot of uh, companies coming out with initiatives towards VR and AR. So I think it's, I think it's something to definitely look into. I haven't used Oculus much for myself and with my colleagues. However, I definitely know that there is a trend in that direction. I want to get to other questions though. My, uh, my question to you guys is, you, you're very, very New York-centric people. Uh, how does culture play into this? Because in the business world, obviously, you have international companies that are global now. So as you in New York, it's always been very different than the as you in the South, or even the as you in the West, there's no chill, and here it's not. So uh, how, do you, how do you, I guess, mesh with international business uh, with an international company so for Compass, we're national right now. We are not yet international, um, but I actually do speak with a lot of my colleagues, you know, other marketing advisors in other regions via these same platforms. Um, we will be cognizant of just the time difference and just be aware of that for you know our, our fellow colleagues. But I still will workplace chat them. We actually have national groups, and that's how we can get in contact to see what other regions are doing through workplace chat for quick questions. Um, and same thing with social media. I, I don't really see too much of that shifting. I think a lot of people, just our generation, still is on these platforms. And I have friends who live all over the nation and internationally as well. And quite frankly, how I keep in touch with my international friends are through some of these social networking platforms from Australia to China to Europe. That and also, I just think it's a matter of making the effort. Um, if you want to talk to someone internationally, it's at your fingertips and you should be able to just get on your phone and do it. Um, this, is, this is more so for talking about like New York-centric, uh, the culture around that and what we know New York. Um, however, if we're dealing with someone across the world who's more uh, centered around Facebook or WeChat, then you'll just make that adjustment because you want to foster that connection. Yeah, um, Gen Z, like we said before, is a really inclusive group. Um, regardless of, I obviously have my own cultural understanding. However, if I'm dealing with someone who is in another culture, I completely immerse myself in, in understanding their culture. I mean, I may not completely understand it completely because I'm not in their culture, but trying to have a firm grasp of it so that when I'm communicating with them, there is an understanding that we mutually respect. Great questions. We're going to run through some more slides, keep the questions coming. So, I do quarterly surveys of Gen Zers nationwide from age 13 to age 23 or 24, and specifically just came out with this in January, but asking Gen Zers, primarily college-age Gen Zers, what are they looking for in future employers? What are priorities? And if you look at that, you would think salary, benefits, usually rises to the top, but more than anything, a workplace culture of diversity and inclusion. 
diversity of thought, diversity of experiences, a place where I can feel like I'm part of the team and not a cog in the machine. 36%. They didn't surprise me because I spend every day with Gen Zers, but I was surprised a little bit that even more so than salary, benefits, you know, so it may not be technology, but it's a really, really important part of culture. Um, so if you want to start again, we'll go that way. Just to oh, yeah. um, so I am obviously a young lady. I feel very strongly about you know, a woman in corporate America. Um, however, my office that I work at is super inclusive, which I'm so thankful for. Last week, I don't know if you all know, it's Black History Month. We had a Black History panel about what it's like to be African American in the public relations agency lifestyle. And they talked about their experiences, how you know they come into work every day and are happy that they see others that look like them because in the past they wouldn't have seen others that look like them. And you know, I'm trying to understand their perspective and like, their struggles, but like having an agency that's that's able to foster that and show me that these that's what these people are experiencing. And then we have like women diversity meetings like Latin panels and you know obviously I'm white and I don't understand that culture and I can try to but having my work want to show me how to be diverse is what's really important to me. And I, think, and I know what you're talking about because I'm familiar with it but I mean they're bringing in panels like a panel discussion like this to her office where she has to literally walk from her office five steps and she's now part of a, an hour or two long panel about I think it's incredible. When, uh, when I walk into the workplace, I don't want to hear an opinion from someone who's just like me. I don't want to engage with someone who's like just just like me. I want to be in, the, in an office space where it's so many different perspectives, different backgrounds, different cultures. What's your story? What's your story? Um, that's like, that's the icebreakers. What's your story? I want to hear what you have to bring to the table. And I, don't, I want it to be something where, I'm, where, where, where I didn't know before, prior to uh, meeting you, prior to understanding your culture. Um, I think I want to gain perspective so it makes me smarter so, and I want to provide my perspective so it makes you smarter and so as a collective we are all collaborating all of our uh, backgrounds. So. I think at the end of the day you know we're you spend so much more time working than you do in your personal life right and so as a young generation we're already understanding this and there is nothing worse than being in a workplace and you are stopped from being able to be productive because you're female because of your race because of you know, your sexuality, whatever it may be, we're, our generation is sick of it. We want to be able to be productive, grow, learn, and not have those things stopping us. Um, and, and you know, kind of like these two said, we're interested in hearing about people different than ourselves. I think that's one of the best things about being in a very diverse workplace that, you know, includes all different types of people is because then you learn from other people. And I'm in a company that is, you know, our CEO is African American. Um, we have we've also been celebrating Black History Month. We've done a lot to celebrate from a digital perspective to also having panels with very interesting people come in. And we're also getting ready for International Women's Month. And it's something that I'm, I'm very proud to say that I'm at a company that is very accepting of everyone. Uh, so you just mentioned that uh, digital So, for example, my, my agency that I work for has offices in the South, we have it on the West Coast and in Chicago, and um, we literally live streamed it to the other offices. So it's not like you can't get out of the meeting, like you have to go. Um, but, you know, because then when those things are broadcasted with such a high media, those people watch it, and then they go tell their family, their friends, and then it just becomes a giant a giant um, medium from word of mouth. And yeah, going right off of what you say, we live stream a lot of these events. So exactly that. Other regions will also, we have a huge sector called Compass Care. So we also do a lot of philanthropic sectors. And rather than picking one not-for-profit, we allow anyone to kind of bring in anything that's very important to them, whether it be something on race, whether it be like something on sexuality, whatever it may be, you can kind of bring that up and that's very open. Um, with our workplace, we make sure that you know everyone is included on our digital platforms and that we just had a speaker, Wes Moore, who runs the Robin Hood Foundation, phenomenal guy, I recommend everyone look into his foundation. You know, Wes and our CEO just did a wonderful fireside chat and that was live streamed all over the country that anyone can log in and watch it. And then we actually have our workplace forum where those types of things are then saved so that anyone can then go on later if they couldn't get the live stream and then tune in as well. There was someone else right here. Yeah. So over the last couple of days, we've been talking about uh, work-life balance, and that having leading edge technology is a major draw for Gen Z. It doesn't come up close to in the top four. So, I'm a 
That's the next slide. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite <laughs> frankly, that's a very good point. Um, I'm surprised that I was actually talking to my friends about this recently, and I'm in a company where when I first started, I got a new Mac Pro. They set everything up. We have our own apps. I am all digital, and one thing I love about my job is flexibility. Um, I actually say that all the time to friends that I have the opportunity that if I need to work from home or if I need to work from another state, depending on whatever it may be, I can do that. And that's one thing I, I actually really like about my job and I would look for in a future job as well. I completely agree. Well, that's an excellent answer, right? And how does it feel when you work from anywhere along with them on the 17%? Well, yeah, when, we, when I did the survey, because I did the survey nationwide of Gen Zers, and I gave them 30 options. So <laughs> even these are coming up in option, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. This is all just you. Yeah, but I think what I want to do on this slide is literally group these five because I think they all tie back to your point, technology, the ability to... So if you group them together... Yeah, I mean, look at that. I mean, a lot of them are overlapping. Four-day work week, ability to work remotely, ability to work from wherever I want. So if you really group some of these together, uh, it's think, significant. I also think it's just important to consider that, like, Gen Z is still so young. So, like, how do they even really decide what they want to do with work? You know, like, the youngest are sure. years old. I mean, we can decide. I have a voice, but, I mean... For someone being on the cusp of that millennial Gen Z and have been in the workforce for a few years now, um, for me that's very important and for my colleagues I've noticed that are around my age, that young, young 30s, late 20s, that is very, very important that we can do anything remotely and quite frankly I'm more pr productive this way. If you can tell me I can have flexibility and when I need to take a doctor's appointment I can work remotely on my phone or work out of my home, I will happily answer you at every single hour because you're letting me have flexibility and freedom. That's completely right. Um, most of my, all of my classes that I still take at Rutgers are uh, all online, except for Hive, of course, but I do all of my work in my underwear, in my bed, warm and cozy. I hope that's not on Instagram. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not on Instagram. But, uh, it's on what, Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's on Snapchat, just the close friends. Um, and what you said about cutting edge technology and expecting that and having that in the workplace, that's, that, I don't think that's a necessary metric because that's an expectation. You have to have technology. But I can workplace. tell you personally, I have a few friends who are, you know, my age range, that late 20s, age range, mid 20s, age range, and a lot of them are in what I would consider an outdated workplace where their computers are only desktop computers. They cannot work from home. They don't have apps they can work with and communicate with. And quite frankly, those friends are telling me how much they hate their jobs and how they're looking for them. And I was just going to add to that for it because I saw a question here. I think that's the other key here is there's a lot of uh, priority right now with HR, chief human officers, chief people officers on how do we attract and recruit Gen Z, but as important if not more, how do we retain Gen Z? Because you're going to have a revolving door where within 12 months they will be back out because there isn't the technology, there isn't the ability to work remotely, there isn't the flexibility, there isn't the diversity and the inclusion. And so that I, I do see, and we talk about this revolving door, you may get them in, but if you don't deliver what they're looking for, they're going to leave right away. Yes? You know, you mentioned Mm -hmm. If you have like a external customer meeting or like a new customer, what is sort of that platform that you choose to have that meeting? Is it a conference call? And then are you enabling the camera? Is well, I mean, it depends on if the, if the end user wants to enable the camera. If they want to have a face-to-face -face or a conference call. Um, but whenever I'm doing conference calls from home, I just grab my computer, go on Google Hangouts, and go in my car because no one's going to mess with me. So for me, going off of that as well, same thing. Um, I usually always start with the video option first. I think face-to-face -face is very important, and that's one thing we do have to be careful with as a generation, that we don't lose face time, because it is really important. So I usually always start with Blue James Link, just because that is a system my company operates on. And if then the person says, hey, I'm remote, I'm in my car, I can't Blue James, you can I call on, then that's completely okay, and that's what I would gear it as. But if I'm at home, I would set something up in my kitchen, good background, you know, make sure I'm dressed, and of course, then go on that Blue James call. I'm just going to build on that. Usually when I present here, especially when I'm presenting the marketers, which that's, that's a slightly different presentation, all three of them brought this up. We've talked a lot about AI and technology, and a big push is what I call, we call HI, human interaction. And it may seem, again, contradictory, but it's really important. Sydney talked about just walking to a manager's office, getting a cup of coffee. Believe it or not, this generation, with all their technology, loves HI. What Sally just talked about, face-to-face. So think about that too, the idea of HI. Uh, there was a question. Yes? So tell me about technology adoption. So let's say you have something like AirPods, which you use, you know, personally, 
and I now use them at work, and I also use them, you know, as I'm walking home to the bus to then get on and take calls. Um, my company, I think my company happened to be in that sector of technology. I would definitely adopt it. I don't know if I may, you know, if I, if I worked at Apple, yes, I would then be taking those AirPods with everything. Um, but for instance, for this, we have our own platforms. We have our apps from a real estate perspective, and I do use those. And I actually send, I use those personally to look things up if I'm ever interested in that potential move. And I also recommend to a lot of my friends that they get on these apps because they're really, really great from an interface perspective. So I would definitely be willing to adopt it and then share it. So you're going to say something? Oh, I use a headset at work sometimes. <laughs> I also always have my AirPods in, but then as soon as like I have a call, um, we have phones that I can like see the person that's calling me, and I always have a headset in because I'm always working while on the phone. Like I'm always just multitasking, um, but I'm always multitasking in everyday life, so it's really not like an adoption. So you're willing to take those AirPods out? Yeah, I would never not be willing. I would be like, no, you can't take my AirPods out. I feel like okay. Like, I also find it depends on where you're working, right? So it kind of goes back to Mark's presentation before of these different workplace environments and these different office spaces. So we're on an open floor plan, but we have a lot of conference rooms. So obviously, if I have to take a call and a conference room is booked, yes, I'm going to have my headphones in so that that end user can properly hear me and listen to me. Uh, but if I find that there's a conference room available, I'll book at a conference room and take those headphones off and go in and either meet with them in person or video chat them. And we've also gone as far as having these phone booth pods, kind of like he showed in his last presentation, where it's for those very one-on-one -on -one quick video calls that I jump into a pod in a phone booth, and then I can also take those headphones off once again because they're sound proof and then go right to my job. We're down in the last couple of minutes, so let me do this. I'm going to fast forward to the last slide. I know we'll stick around a little bit for questions, one-on-one, -on -one, FaceTime, a little bit of HI, right? Let me just run through this really fast. Um, again, this is more about the partnership and collaboration with the employer, especially as it relates to career evolution. Um, so I'll, I'll finish up on here. So engaging Gen Z at work. We've got to think of the Gen Z solar system as well. Where are they consuming content, sharing content, the technology? We've talked a lot about that. So it's just starting to get to that mindset. I talked about Target a little bit earlier. They have been on the cutting edge of this, and I think from a marketing perspective, but really from an employee perspective, I'm a big believer in you know, creating think tanks and incubators with your Gen Z employees. Don't try to figure out how they want to use technology. Don't try to figure out what they want to get out of this job. Bring them into the fold and create a think tank. I just created the first ever think tank at Rutgers University for young alums, because the Alumni Association didn't know how to engage people graduating 2019, 18, 17. So that's an easy one. Let's Mark, bring 40 in here. Really here. quickly jump on that from a workplace environment. Something that my company Compass does is we have a feedback forum. So they've integrated a forum onto our own webpage from our customers that they can have access to, to internal staff, where we have any feedback on everything from the office setting to our actual jobs and how we can improve things. You go right on that feedback forum and you can put that in, and they actually weekly look at it and we'll let you know if it's in consideration, in progress, or whatever it may be. This is more, I always say, from a marketing, but I think um, Sally said this earlier. Every employer, every job, every, every company has assets and access. Give that to your Gen Zers. Give them access to things. Give them assets to work with. Inspire them. Um, and it goes beyond just community initiatives. We talked about it's all about digital. Sydney said she doesn't follow influencers, but she does. She follows other Gen Zers. Friends. Gen Z friends are the biggest influence in the lives of Gen Z. Like That's who they listen to most. Technically, like, I'm considered a nano influencer. Yep. Yeah. No, you are. <laughs> you are. are. Yeah. They may not have millions of followers, but the thousand or two or three that follow them listen closely to what they have to say. Um, and again, purpose over, with the idea of purpose over. So, real quick, last slide. If you're an employer, if you work in a corporation, you know, pretty simple. I think Sally just said it. I actually survey and listen to Gen Z employees as they're making their way from college to a career. What technology are you using? What would be more efficient? What would be more effective? What could we adopt here? What could we try and test and learn? Um, I love the idea. I call all my Gen Zers CEOs, those who just started working. Bring your CEOs into the fold. Really create that think tank of CEOs. They've got a lot to offer. They'll deliver incredible value. Evolve and test not just technology, but could we be using YouTube more? Could we be using Twitter, Instagram as part of the solar system here? Could we be using Slack? Test and learn is great. Why? Because we're allowed to fail in the test and learn. That's why it's called a test and learn, right? Um, last one's more HR, but it's less about managing Gen Zers. It's really about mentoring them. They're not looking for managers. They're looking for collaborators and mentors. 
And last one, you know, Power Gen Z employees to truly inform and inspire initiatives like Sid said that prioritize diversity, prioritize inclusion. Um, we ran through that pretty quickly, but last question or two. As I was listening to this, and, and, and I was saying that corporate legal departments are probably have a worrying and asked by the Trump rules <laughs> in this case. And, and it goes to the question is, is that obviously you're using these tools for business purposes, which then makes them legally discoverable conversations that could be subpoenaed. If I'm a corporate person, say, yes, so absolutely use the social media, but I need access to all your communications in there. Would you still be the way you are on those tools? Personally, for me, yes. Um, you know, it, it's just being intelligent. I would never put anything that's a sensitive topic, um, a you know, a topic that's not supposed to be said to the world on these platforms. If I find there's something I need to speak with my manager about that I would not want everyone hearing or knowing, I will happily book a conference room and set up a face-to-face -face meeting or something like that. I say it depends on uh, how much or how many, like the applications and whatnot. And also, my biggest thing is like. If you're willing to work at a company, the, the company is accommodating to you, so accommodate to the company. That's what I think. There are other questions. Uh, I don't know, well, half the audience up here is wearing Apple Watch or a smartwatch or something, but none of you are. Cyborgs. <laughs> <laughs> so, is for, technology or mistrustful? Um, I can't afford it. What do you mean? <laughs> has one and I, I kind of shake my head. I'm like, why do you, you know, you sleep with this thing. Like you're getting these buzzers on it, although we can put it on do not disturb. That's too much for me. Um, I have my phone here. I can assure you one of the first things I'm going to go do is check all of those apps that I talked about on my phone to make sure I'm up to speed with work and what else is going on. Um, but for me, the, the watch being really attached to me is actually something that for me personally was a little bit too far. I think it's amazing and I would do it. It's just, I don't think I'm ready yet um, and you're still just we still are the data that is feeding the human limbic system of AI. And that's, what, that's how I kind of look at it. Let's get a couple more questions. Uh, we touched on a lot of different platforms within the workplace. Um, do you guys use WebEx or Microsoft Teams? Personally, no. So personally, no. Um, we actually, my company personally is, I will only use Microsoft like just the basic office package, but because of my clients. I have a lot of clients who are in that 50 up range where they're going to send me documents on a Word document that I have to help them with. So I have it for that purpose, but how I actually function, I use G um, I use Google Sheets, Google Slides, Google Docs. We have shared team drives that certain people have access to, and that is how I personally operate in the workplace. Who's that? So how do For recruiting, how do employers find LinkedIn. you? Um, LinkedIn is rapidly growing. We actually just had an entire um, talk with a LinkedIn expert on our marketing team because it is they're now ad adding a lot more advertising components to it. It's becoming more social than it originally was. So LinkedIn is definitely that first point of contact. And quite frankly, um, for an employer, I wouldn't necessarily say find me this way, but I am public on something like an Instagram, and I would never post anything that I wouldn't want the world to see. So you know, if someone did find me on Instagram, that's okay. I've had other brands find me on Instagram, for instance, and maybe that's how I've ended up working with them or communicating with them. But for, primarily from a professional standpoint, standpoint, it would be LinkedIn, or if I'm applying to jobs, it would be LinkedIn, and then talking to my sphere of influence and going on things like a glass door or, or different recruiting type sites to find jobs. Uh, I think LinkedIn's great, and using LinkedIn Sales Navigator is really, really effective, and using filters to see geography of where, like, where, where they are geographically, their function, their title, you can put tags on them saying like potential prospect, whatnot. But the real thing is if you're, it, like for, uh, for let's say my LinkedIn profile, I have my phone number on there, and uh, if you want to be blunt and you want me, just call me. I'll answer the phone, and if, and if, and if, you, and if I'm like, there's an employer, on, an employer on the line, that's gonna grab my attention. That's like, this guy means business. And to a lesser degree, if you're not gonna go that far, like she said, I'm public on Instagram, go follow me, shoot me a DM, something like that. Like I got connected with uh, one of uh, Mark's, uh, Mark's guys just by going through LinkedIn, seeing that, oh, they happen to work, they happen to go to Rutgers University, and then I found them on Instagram. Luckily, some of them were, were uh, public, and then fostered the connection. Going off of your topic too, you know, we're smart with these tools. So say you randomly found us on one of these platforms, we're not just gonna all of a sudden dive right in and say, oh, great, a job offer on Instagram. No, we're gonna research you. 
we have Google at our fingertips. So the first thing we'll do is we will Google everything and kind of find every link about you out there to understand you before we even speak to you if you don't call us and you find us digitally. One last question. We'll finish up. Is that anybody? Right. Right. How long do you guys use auto What is your definition of auto So for my office, it's, it's more of a conference room. Um, but what we do is we have conference rooms on all different floors, and you can just book them out. Anyone has the option. So I would say once a day, at least, I'm in a conference room face-to-face -face just because I am customer-facing, so I meet with my customers that way. And my pod, that's how we call our teams on our department, um, with my pod at least once a week, we kind of have a huddle. We have a brainstorm, we have a meeting, and that gives updates face-to-face -face in a conference room. There was actually one more question, so we'll get one more. I think you So, uh, <laughs> So I'm, I'm just gonna say I'm 30, right? So I'm like just like a little bit older than some of you guys. At what point is it frustrating to have, you know, we're talking about Slack, we're talking about Teams. You got, you know, Zoom has their chat features, which I've used extensively with external customers. At what point is it too many apps, or do you guys just not care? Because switching between the apps, it's just another app on the computer. So I find um, from a company perspective, it's something to establish right ahead with your team. So when I got into my job, the first thing they said is, okay, here's the breakdown and you're onboarding. You know, we email important updates and with our customers, we use Zendesk. If you want to chat cross-functionally within our team, you use workplace chat. And that is how we get in touch with each other. So I think it's really just setting those standards in the workplace and kind of saying, you know, we have this for this, this for that, and that for that, and then that's that's set in stone, and then you know how to function off. I think she's absolutely right. Um, however, when you're talking about, like, let's say you're saying when it gets to too much, too, or too many app applications, and it's like, where do we stop? That I gauge based off of the credibility of the app. Is the app legit? Like, who's using the app? If someone cool is using the app, it has a little bit of the cool factor. Um, if it seems like it doesn't have much of a following, or it just doesn't look aesthetically pleasing, then I'm going to dump it. In this case, it's definitely a plus it's more. If you have an app, you're also using another app, what features does this one app have that this one doesn't have? And could we possibly like, add a plugin for this one to also include that? It's just going to, too much is too much. Before we end, well, I want to know, do you want us to do more of these? Yes. <laughs> yes? Okay, that's all I need to know. Thanks, Do you have one more point? I, I just had a quick follow-up. You know, at what point do you guys feel comfortable, you know, reaching out to you? Because a lot of folks in, in this room interact with IT. It's, it's a, a very common thesis, especially in our world and our relationship to them. Um, at what point, from your perspective, as you know, the end end user in our world, do you feel comfortable with saying, "Hey, IT, I really like this." Then, at what point do you find it frustrating that that IT department maybe just shuts you down? I think That's if you're IT, so if you're, if we're speaking about IT in my company, they work on these same platforms, so I have no problem chatting them and giving them feedback on these. If we're talking about maybe the company feedback, so if I would actually go to Facebook to talk to them about Workplace, if they're easily accessible, I have no problem doing it. Give me a live chat function and someone I can actually get to instantaneously with a question, and I have no problem doing it. But if I have to send through this whole form and take 20 minutes to fill this thing out, and you're not going to email me back for 48 business hours, I'm done, right? I don't want to, I don't want to talk to you. The lower the power distance, the easier. All right. This was great. Highly collaborative, as we said. Thank you for the questions around. Hopefully you got some insights. These guys got to run to work, but they'll be around for at least five more minutes, I'm sure. So thank you very much.